And yeah, we can share your, see your screen. Okay, great. So um, the the presentation I'm going to give is about obviously my exhibit, and it will have three parts. The first part is really the title from chess to the game of war. And it's about how I uh, devised a concept for my exhibit. The second part will be how I implemented it with a few examples. And the third part will be some uh, words of advice on how to do well in thematic exhibiting, of course, using uh, the examples uh, from my collection. So I started collecting stamps. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Some, I think, sorry. I started collecting chess stamps back in 1983. And within uh, a few years, I had a fairly complete uh, collection of chess stamps. And at that time, I was a topical collector, not a thematic collector, a topical collector. I only cared about chess. I collected all chess stamps and stamps only. And my ambition was to get all the chess stamps that are out there. And at any point in time, I knew exactly how many stamps I had. I remember thinking I have 424 chess stamps. Yeah. And, and that was the achievement for me. And a few years later, um, I was looking for a next for the next challenge, and uh, it took about you know early nineties, about ten years of collecting, that I decided that I should put together an exhibit. Uh, basically, I just wanted to show people what I have because I thought it was wonderful, and of course now I know that it was nothing; it was a very simple and common collection. But at the time I was very proud of it and I want people to see what I have. And so I decided to put together an exhibit and that was absolutely one of the best decisions I've ever made. Because in all probability, had I not decided to put together an exhibit, I would have stopped collecting altogether because there was no challenge, there was nothing to aspire for. And of course, I knew something about exhibiting. I knew that I have to get more material. I knew that I have to put a plan together. So I started collecting uh, cancellations and so on. And I decided to put together an, a plan for an exhibit. And I had a plan which I thought was good. Obviously now I know it was embarrassing. And I showed uh, my proposed plan to an expert who uh, was also a friend. And I would like to mention his name, it's, uh, Mr. Ron Berger, uh, who passed away many years ago. And here's a piece of advice. It is very important to get assistance from people of experience, especially in early stages. And the advice works both ways because um, it is also a duty of people of experience to help novice exhibitors. Anyway, when I showed my plan to uh, Ron Berger, he told me that chess is really a bad topic. And he said, I've never seen a good chess exhibit. And this was not encouraging words, to be honest, but there are true words. And his criticism was that chess exhibits are all alike and they tend to be documentary rather than thematic. They don't really tell a story. So in, he said in every chess exhibit, there's a chapter called the world champions. And it starts with the first world champion, then the second, then the third, and the fourth. It says, by the time you get to the fifth, I don't care anymore. And then there's another chapter about chess Olympiads. 
and the first and the second and the third and the fourth and then so on till the 27th. And who cares? It's not interesting. And uh, basically doesn't tell a story. And he told me that if I'll do the same, I'll end up with the same result, an exhibit which is not really interesting and doesn't score high. And he said, he told me specifically that I need to find a new concept for chess. And he said, it should be a concept that reflects your personality. Yoram, sorry to yes. interrupt, but we don't see your slides advancing. You don't see what? We, your slides are not advancing. You're still on the first okay. slide. Okay, sorry, sorry. Something here is pause. I don't know. Your screen sharing is paused. How do I'm sorry, let me start again. Your screen sharing. Okay, let's see. This works. Have to put it Can in. You see now a different slide? To... We just see your slide, the first slide. I think you have to put it in presentation mode. No, it's in presentation mode. Um, you know, we only see the your, first slide and then on the side- Your screen sharing is paused and I don't know how resume share. Okay, now I think it now it will work. Let's see, now can you see- No, wait, I think, I think I know what is happening. So I think uh, you might have another monitor attached to your computer. No, no, I don't have. You don't? Okay, then I would because it increases the share as it is, soon as I move. Okay, now if you're if you just hit arrow buttons. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. What happens is uh, as soon as I move to presentation mode, um, the sharing is free is frozen is paused, and every time I release the pause. Okay, I'll, I'll let's try again. I'll share screen. Maybe go into presentation mode first before you share the screen. Okay, let's see. I'll, let me just see this. No, okay. I don't know. Let's share new. Ah, okay. Let's see. Sorry about that. Let me hold on a sec. Mm -hmm. Where is it? זה לא הוא, אנחנו, אני המנהל כרגע, הוא בכלל ירד. So I had the opinion of Ron Berger said that there are no good chess exhibits around. They're all doing the same. They're all documentary. They're um, having a chapter, all the world champions, all the Olympiads, all the tournaments. And he really advised me to find a new concept which should reflect my personality. And I remember I was very annoyed with that uh, comment because at that time I didn't know I have a personality. Uh, but it gave me something to think about. Uh, now, I want to explain the problem with the topic chess in terms of scoring in exhibits. Chess is a modern philatelic topic. The first stamp was issued in 1947. Uh, the first cancellation is 1923, and there's only a handful of them before World War II. And most chess stamps come from dubious countries, and we've talked about that yesterday. So uh, with that in mind, how can one score high on rarity? And if you can't score high in rarity, you can't score high in condition. And how will you show philatelic knowledge if 
all everything you have is 20th century and in the latter part of 20th century. So that's one problem. The other problem is from the thematic side. I kind of score high on innovation if I do the same things other, others have done before me. And I can't score high on thematic knowledge if I remain within the topic, if I remain a topical uh, collector. So uh, that meant to me that a new approach should be uh, developed. The approach should be personal and should show chess in a broader perspective. And it took me quite a number of years till I had everything set down in my, in my mind. And the idea I came up with is to show chess as the game of war. Now, this is not topical anymore. This is thematic. This does not stay within the boundaries of chess only. It involves other uh, items from other fields. Why the concept of showing chess as the game of war? Well, chess is often called the game of war. Uh, we all know that. If you look at chess literature, they often use military terms when they discuss games. A game is often called a battle. We talk about sacrificing material. Sometimes a, a, a chess game is described as a bloodbath. And at the end, the white empire has fallen and so on and so on. So there's a military connection here. And it goes further. The pieces in chess, every piece in chess actually originates from ancient war apparatus. And, and I'll show that a little later. There's also a similarity between chess and war in terms of strategy and so forth. So really my concept was to tell the story of chess. It is still the story of chess, but to demonstrate along the way the similarities and sometimes the differences to real life war at each step along the way. Now, I want to emphasize that it remains the story of chess. So in chess, there's no air force. So there would be no air force in my exhibit. I don't care about the history of military as a theme. I only want to show examples that show the similarity and differences between chess and war. Is this the right concept for me? Well, certainly is because it is something no one has ever done before. It gave me what I felt was an intellectual challenge, which is something I really look forward to. And it also reflects who I am as a person. I have interest in history and in military history. So I thought it's really the right thing for me. And this concept allows me to um, uh, show, to tell a story and to show quality material. And it also allows me to devote a full chapter to the uh, chess tactics and strategy, uh, which is far more than any other chess exhibit I've ever seen. And I'll give some examples a little later. So first uh, uh, thing I had to do is come up with a plan and I devised a plan that was based on four chapters. The first chapter is everything before the game starts, the rules of the game, how to win a game, and the tournaments in which you play. So the first chapter will show the pieces, the board, and the players. We have assembled that, we can start playing. The rules of the game is who starts, how the game progresses, what are the casualties during the game, and how it comes to an end. The third chapter is once we know the rules, we want to win a game, so we need to take defensive and offensive measures. We need to control the center, there are tactics of how to win and enforce the checkmate and so on. And once we really know how to play, then we go to tournaments 
starting from local tournaments, going to world tournaments, and winning, uh, the, the, of course, the end is winning the world championship. And that was the plan I had first had in mind, and I was very pleased with it. And of course, I should mention that each step, of course, I need to find the corresponding military examples. I was very pleased with my plan. And the first time I exhibited locally, a judge told me that my story leaks, lacks an ending. And lo and behold, I looked at the plan again and said, he's right. There is no ending here. The fact that somebody won the world championship, that's not an end to a story. And it took me again a time, some time to figure out what the right ending of the story is. And then I realized when I found what the right ending was, I realized that I also missed a beginning. So I added two shorter chapters. The first chapter is how it all began, how chess was invented, how, um, uh, why it was invented. Well, it was invented because uh, people, mankind throughout history takes daily events, daily chores, and makes them into a game to give it a better spin. I know Monopoly is a game that we play to sort of imitate the financial world, so on. And the last chapter, the ending to the story is that while chess remained the same in the last 200 years or so, war has changed dramatically. So currently chess is no really, is, is, is no longer the, war, the game of war anymore. There are better substitutes to learn uh, how to master war than to play chess for video games, for simulators and so on. So that is uh, the correction or the revised plan I have. And again, there's a lesson here, a word of advice. Uh, we should really listen to the judges. I go to exhibits around the world and I see uh, exhibitors arguing with the judges, spending time, sometimes even shouting at them and not listening enough. And if we listen to the judges, we learn a lot. We can learn a lot. And the greatest uh, steps of uh, progress I've made was through listening to judges. So here's my current plan. Uh, it includes four major chapters uh, from two to five that are roughly balanced. They don't need to be exactly balanced. They don't need to have the same number of pages exactly. If they do, then something is wrong, but they should be roughly balanced. The first and last chapters, well, they are shorter. That's uh, also very appropriate. Uh, and um, I should also say that I, uh, out of all these I have 96, I now have eight frames, so 96 exhibit pages. I use a system of three pages in a row, so it's not 128, it's 96. Out of these, only four are devoted to chess world champions, not a full chapter, just four pages. And only one to chess Olympiads, not a full chapter, because within this story, chess Olympiads, just do not deserve more than that. Uh, so now a few examples of how I implement my, my plan uh, in, in reality. And I'm gonna show one example from each chapter along the way. So of the major chapters. So uh, the first example is the pieces. Every piece in chess, is a replica of war apparatus in the old, in the old uh, world. So the, the pawn is the foot soldier and the knight is the uh, uh, soldier riding a horse and so on. 
and the rook, this is the example here, the rook is a chariot. So I show at the top uh, chariots of one or multiple horses that were used in war. And then there's a stamp, unfortunately from Mongolia, but still a stamp that shows a chess piece that is a chariot. And then you may ask yourself how a chariot became a rook. What's the connection? And the truth is that the, the, when chess came to the Western world from Persia, the world, the Persian word for rook, which is for chariot, sorry, which is rook, was confused by the Italians with the word rocca, which is a fortress. So I show here fortress. And this is why uh, and the stamp with the watermark shows that a modern rook is uh, designed as a watchtower or something like that. Uh, the set, next example, rules of the game, I want to show the casualties. Now, this page is about the casualties of chess uh, and right, right after that will come casualties of war. And so some heavy stuff is coming, but I want to give a page for the casualties in chess. So what are the casualties in chess? Of course, it's a lot nicer than war. No lives are lost, it's just the pieces. So if the pieces were missent to battle as the consolation here by the general, they can be eaten by the opponent and they are removed from the board. And these are the actual casualties in chess. But that's not enough to hold a page. And then one day I was going through my uh, collection and I know something clicked. I saw this stamp and the stamp shows uh, a boy playing chess and he's leaning on his head and deep in thought. And he looks like he has a really bad headache. So that gave me the idea to add the text that the worst harm that can occur to a chess player is a headache. And then I found this stamp with a perforation error where the perforation really runs through the middle of the head and the text would then read, not only a headache can be even a splitting headache. And I should give credit to Lawrence Fisher for giving me that idea of splitting headache. And if you have a headache, then you should just take a pill and you'll be fine. No worse harm will happen to you. And um, normally I, don't, I can't see the people right now, but normally when I show that uh, item with a headache pills, people smile. And, and that smile for me means I've done what I wanted to do. There's an element of surprise here. There's something that is connected to the story, but it's not um, directly related to the topic. And that is what innovation is all about. So these are the casualties in uh, chess and casualties in war. Well, here, as I said, um, things are, are not as nice. Casualties in wars are our first prisoner of wars. This is a letter from 1706 from a prisoner of war. A Scottish guy was uh, taken prison uh, by French in the uh, war of the Spanish succession. And at that time, if you were a POW, you would be better off dead than alive because you would be taken by the other side and you would be made the slave of the slaves of the master on the other side. This guy is lucky, he's wealthy, he's educated, so he can write a letter and send that letter to his family and plea that they would pay ransom to get him released. And I'm, nobody knows what happened to him eventually. So POWs are casualties of war, and then uh, soldiers often get wounded in the battle. 
and here we have a letter sent from military hospital for which they are taken. This here is a letter sent uh, to a soldier in World War I, a British soldier in France. And the letter was returned to sender with the manuscript saying killed in action. And it's quite probable that that's how the family learned that the loved one had died in battle. And those who died in battle are buried in military cemeteries. Chapter three, or third chapter, sorry, is about uh, war uh, tactics and strategy in uh, chess and war. This is about a page about a siege in chess. Uh, and uh, there are some examples here of how uh, one side is under siege. And in chess, you cannot uh, just do nothing. You have to make a move so uh, when it's your turn. So even if you don't have a good move, you have to play. This, this, no, even if you don't have a good move, you have to play. And here's an example of the black has to move and he has to ruin his own position. And eventually he will be checkmated because he has to move, he's under siege and he can only harm himself this way. And here's the equivalent of siege and war. I've taken the example of the 1870 uh, war of uh, France and Prussia. And you can see that I can put here some really good items like a ballon monté and the ball of Moulin. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a mess uh, system of sending letters to besieged Paris uh, by sort of by containers that were thrown into the Seine River and were supposed to drift with water into the, into the city. Uh, there were, I think, 50 or 55 of them used and none of them, absolutely none of them got in time to the city. After the war, some were recovered, about half of them were recovered as recent as 40 years ago, one was recovered. Uh, this letter was sent in the first uh, um, container that was retrieved after the war and it got a special cancellation and so on. And it's uh, a very nice item that is featured in a book called The Most Important 100 uh, Items of the Siege of Paris in 1870. So it's, it's a quality item. World champion, I do not refer to all chess world champion. It's simply not interesting to list all of them. Some of them were you know, first among equals and some were really cut above. And I'm only interested in those who were cut above, those who actually or truly conquered the chess world. And no example is better than Bobby Fischer, who for several years really demolished everybody. It's really incredible what the guy has done. Um, now this, obviously the material here is modern because Fischer, you can't, there's no items of Fischer that are not from the sixties and later, uh, but still I managed to find an original artwork to give an, an perforation error to give this page some quality. And even with a poor, poor quality, Fisher is important enough to get a full page of his own. Like world champions who conquered the chess world, there are some people who conquered the real world. Uh, one example is uh, Alexander the Great, my teacher was, my history teacher was very fond of the um, saying that Alex, when he finished his wars, he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. And in a sense, that's true because he, Alexander conquered the entire world he knew of. And uh, what I do here to show 
the size of his uh, uh, empire, I put a small map here to show in green the areas that Alexander has conquered. And I show letters from two cities that he established and are named after him. This is Alexandria in, Ky in Egypt and Kandahar in today's Afghanistan. Both are named after Alexander and he created those cities. And of all the cities that Alexander created and bear his name, these two are the first, th furthest apart. So that's why they were taken. And again, I have here the opportunity to show quality items. This is a letter from Alexandria in Egypt in, from 1420. And this letter is from Kandahar in, uh, in Afghanistan. It was India back then. And uh, this is from the first or the second year that the post office was opened there. There's a whole story about how we date this letter with the different uh, typing of or different uh, uh, spelling of the names Kandahar. Another important empire is the British Empire uh, on which the sun never set. So I show here uh, stamps of Victoria and George V because at that at their time, the British Empire really peaked. And I show the Malrady, which shows Britain at the center of the world, ruling the world. And there's a nice variety of here of a paper fold, which is quite rare. And here is the a block of four of the Canadi Canadian stamp that shows the British Empire in the red. And due to re-entry of the red color, there are additional islands that were created, fictitious islands that were created, and they sort of expand the empire beyond what it really was. And of course, I have to show the sun because the stamp really shows that the sun never set on the British Empire. Um, so now I'm getting to part where I discuss some of the uh, evaluation criteria, and I want to give some words of advice. So uh, first about, I've, I've covered plan and the division to chapters and sub chapters, but I want to talk about development now. Another 15 points are allocated for development. First thing I do to make sure the development is good is I give titles. Each page has the title of the chapter and I do that in uh, say half tone, so it's not very strong, but you have the chapter and the sub chapter on the left and on the right there's title for the page. So I don't like the numerating five, two, three, one, and so on. There are only two levels of numerating, but there's a title to a page that describes what this page is all about. Uh, when I write the page, I use the continuous approach. Every, uh, every place that ends with three points and it's continued on and on. And there's a philatelic, uh, thematic text, sorry, thematic text about each item. So each item really promotes the story. Uh, I see so many exhibits where people say, okay, I want to devote a page for uh, Isaac Newton. And they put four different items that show Newton. That's not development. A good development, every item needs to make the story progress. And by making the text connected to the item really above the item, it makes the story flow better. When I first exhibited this internationally, this was in 2014 in Paris, and one of the judges was Peter, 
uh, asked me, I didn't use that approach then, and he asked me why the Karpov stem appears before the Kasparov stem. Well, there's a reason. But when I had one block of text above, the reason wasn't clear. Now it's clear that first you use Karpov, then Karpov plays against Kasparov, and then Kasparov becomes the king. So this is how the story promoted without repetition. And my advice, again, if you really want to score high on development, avoid redundancy, avoid repeating yourself. And if you do that with a continuous approach, I think you're almost guaranteed to do well in development. Innovation, innovation is five points. And of course I have an innovative concept. No one has ever done chess the way I've done it, but that's not enough to get five points. You need to keep uh, showing innovation throughout. And innovation is also shown by the application of material. So here's an example. This is from the page when I talk about uh, uh, the game, but how a king is uh, threatened with a check. And in the sign language of chess, check is, is marked with a plus sign. So I use here uh, a cover of a letter sent from Japan to South Africa uh, in 1939. And it was on board a seaplane that crashed in Mozambique. So you can see that this is a really um, a cover that went through hell. And it has, since it was sent registered, it has the plus sign, which I can attribute to uh, chess sign language. Uh, thematic knowledge. All exhibitors know their fields. No one collects something he doesn't know. But we need to convey that to the judges. We need to show how deeply we know our theme. And one way to do that, well, Peter has mentioned yesterday, the plan has to be correct, it has to cover all aspects and so on. But one way you can show a judge that you really know your theme is by finding something or a point, a thematic point, which is not easily noticeable. We've seen this item on, on the page where I talked about siege in chess. Uh, the situation on the board here is what we call in chess Zugzwang. Uh, black is compelled to move and ruin his position and so on. But uh, in all chess exhibits I've seen, nobody exhibited this item and referred to the position on the board. I exhibited in Budapest a few months ago and I had the um, some senior judges uh, gave me critique to my exhibit and some of them who collect chess or play chess, they, they know the item and said, I've never noticed that, that this is a position of a Tsugsvang. So this is a way a judge can appreciate that you go deep into your theme. Another way to show thematic knowledge and this is a quote taken from the um, guidelines, is to find surprising material, something that does not belong to your topic, but fits the story thematically. Here's a part of page about uh, titles in chess. Chess players get rated, there's a rating list, and if they're really good, they get a title of a grandmaster. Well, the idea of calling a chess player a grandmaster, if he's good enough, was actually by, at least according to some sources, by the Russian Tsar Nikolai II. So that's a good place to put these items. And a reasonable judge is likely to see that stamp or to see that proof of a Nikolai II and come and say, what is he doing there? And if he looks and he reads the text, he would say, okay, this guy knows his theme well enough. Um, 
So that's about thematic knowledge. Moving to philatelic knowledge, a great Achilles heel of many thematic exhibitors. There's a reason why thematic exhibitors usually score low on philatelic knowledge. And it's because most of us, like myself, come from a topical background. We collected stamps because we liked the picture, but we didn't have any background in uh, postal history or in traditional philately. So we're lacking knowledge there. Uh, we need to improve as philatelists, if we exhibit, we need to improve that part. And I should say, nobody expects us to get uh, to the level of, uh, to the depth of studies and research done in thematic, in uh, traditional philately or in postal history, because our uh, exhibit is spread over time and places, then we can't simply go to so many archives and study that deeply but we need to learn more than most of us do. And my advice here is to learn. We learn through reading. We should learn to read books and journals and on the search on the internet. And we should read outside our comfort zone, not only about thematics and not only about our specific theme. We should go to lectures we should look at exhibits. When we have, we're, we're attending an exhibition, we should go to the postal history section. We should go to the traditional philately section and learn from there. And here's an example. This is uh, one of the things we're expected to do is to do a philatelic studies. And um, here's a study of the Serbia stamp 1915 of King Petter at the battlefield and it shows uh, you know, that I know philately, but one of the things I did in Budapest is I went to the uh, traditional philately section and there were actually two exhibits about that specific issue. And uh, or at least partially about that specific issue. And I looked at these exhibits, I studied them, I photocopied the pages, and I made sure that my text, the way I describe items, and what I say about them is correct and accurate. Here's another example of how, uh, of what we're expected to do. We need to find interesting covers to show philatelic knowledge. You cannot show philatelic knowledge without having covers and discussing rates and routes and discussing special features on these covers. This is a letter from 1918 or se sorry, 17, uh, sent from Palestine, uh, from the uh, paymaster of the Austrian army and he sends it registered and the registration label here says Feldpost the, the Jerusalem. So it really uh, nails down where it is. And this was offered in an auction uh, a few years ago. And the auction catalog said there are only two in existence. I wasn't sure about the two. And I was really scared of writing there are two in existence for the fear that in the exhibition hall, the judge will be able to take me to other frames and show me others. So I contacted uh, an expert. You learn from experts. I con contacted this guy, uh, Tzvika Aloni, who's an expert in uh, uh, Holy Land philately. And he said, no, there are more than two, certainly more than two. There's one in this collection, there's one in this. And, and he compiled about five or six that he knew of. And he said, since I know five or six, there might be a seventh or eight, please write less than 10 are known. And so that's what I put in here. And the advice here is not to trust the auction catalog without checking it. 
And I should say that um, I gave this specific example because today is Saturday and on Monday last, uh, I participated in Tzvika Aloni's funeral. He passed away after illness and he will be missed. Uh, another thing, uh, thematic philatelists do badly. Many of them put um, philatelic covers to show cancellations. Here's a cancellation for a chess Olympiad. This is a commercial cover and it was sent registered, it was sent by airmail, even though it's inside Poland. So all these features, um, registration, express mail, tax mail, and so on, make the item interesting. It gives you a means to discuss the rate, like I do here, and to show your philatelic knowledge. Um, let's skip that. Another way of showing philatelic knowledge is by, again, quote from the guidelines, skillful use of important philatelic materials. In chess, the most important philatelic item is the San Marino inverted red rooks error. This is the normal stamp from San Marino. And there was one sheet of 40 stamp, which was put into the printer upside down to the red color printer. So the red rooks are standing on their heads, so to speak. And I have a block of four, the only multiple known from this uh, issue, from this error. So it's extremely rare item and I'm very proud of having it in my collection. But how do I use it? So uh, what I do is I take a page uh, about the promotion of pawns. When a pole reaches the last row, it converts into a queen, it's a queen. And so you can have more than one queen on the board at a given time. Now, what do you do if you don't have an extra queen to put on board? You take a rook and you place it upside down. And you do that with the rook because it's the only piece in chess that can actually stand on its head. So this is um, a skillful use of material. I use the printing error to show a rook standing on its head and functioning as a queen. Rarity and condition. Um, again, in rarity, we lose, this is where we lose most of the points. Um, and partially because a lot of thematic exhibitors do not fully understand what rarity is. They think rarity is having few copies around and that's not all the story. Rarity is also coupled with importance. Here's a stamp which is relatively rare. It's from the only sheet uh, of missing black color of uh, uh, Central Africa or something. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's Central Africa. 25 stamps are known. So there's some rarity to that, but there's absolutely no importance. Here's another stamp. You may have seen it before. There are 100 copies of this around. Do you really think that this, the inverted Jenny, is less or equally rare to the missing red color in Central Africa? I mean, if you do, you're really out of your mind. So we should always remember that the number of copies is not the only factor. We should really look for important rare items. How to improve rarity? One of the things I do is, okay, I have a page about the chess knight and the warrior and the horse. And I need to use, I wanted to use this stamp, the uh, UPU stamp of England 1929, which show St. George on the, and, uh, on the horse fighting the dragon. This is an expensive stamp but it's not rare in any way. So to gain rarity, I replace it with a specimen. A specimen from 1929 has rarity, 
of course, a specimen from the 70s or 80s has no rarity and shouldn't be used. Another example, we've talked about the siege in Paris, and I have a stamp. There's a stamp that shows the Ballon Monte uh, balloon mail. Um, it is relevant, very relevant to the story, but the stamp is nothing in philatelic terms. So I replaced the stamp with the acceptance proof in sepia. There are only three to five copies of this. So this is really rare. And this is how I gain rarity points. So one advice is try to replace common stamps with proofs of specimens. Only do that if the stamps are old. There's no rarity in uh, proofs from the 90s. Another option, this is a page about the Roman Empire. I have to give uh, some present, uh, representation to Julius Caesar and to Augustus Caesar, but they only show on very common stamps. So what I did here is take uh, the Augustus stamp with an error and to put and use the uh, Julius Caesar stamp on a cover and an interesting cover which has a special rate and has gone through airmail and has some overprinting issues and censorship and so on. So there's something to describe and show philatelic knowledge as well. So some stamps could be replaced with errors or with uh, usage on commercial, commercially interesting covers. Condition, there's not a lot to say here, only that I try to get the cancellations and particularly the older cancellations because modern material we always have in good condition, but the older cancellations in supreme condition, it's really important. This will give you an extra point in rarity. And it's also an economic advice, which I discovered in, the wrong way. It is cheaper to buy an expensive quality item than to buy a cheaper poor quality item and then replace it with the quality items you should have bought in the first place. So do not compromise on quality of these items. So with this, I come to an end. Uh, just to summarize, uh, chess is a to popular topic but the exhibits so far have done poorly. I should say that I know of one exhibit that got 85 points in large Vermeil with a certain amount of push. I do not know of anyone else who's got large Vermeil, let alone gold or large gold. And the reason is because they lacked a real story. Some of them lacked a real story and the material is simply not there. And you, if you want to get to the higher level, you need to go outside the topic to develop a theme and to develop a good story. And uh, the good concept, the concept I think is good, is essential. It was a crucial step for me. And uh, I'm seriously thinking it really reflects who I am, my personality and my preferences. And through that, I had the most exciting and enjoyable intellectual um, challenge here. And I hope I did well. Thank you. I'm done. Colin, can you unmute, unmute yourself and see if there are any questions? Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know what happened, we had some computer problems and Pratim kindly stepped in and, and took over as the host. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions for Yoram. Um, unfortunately, in the room here, we missed the first few minutes. Um, so Yoram, we apologize for that. Um, do we have questions for Yoram? Okay. Um, do you want to try with the Okay. Um, Yoram. Yeah. Um, Van, 
Van Siegling, who is the uh, exhibitor of the Harry Potter um, exhibit, he yes. wants to know if you've ever exhibited anywhere in the US. There may be an ulterior motive. He may be trying to encourage you to. The question is, <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you done it? No, unfortunately, I haven't. Well, uh, actually, no, I haven't. No, I have, uh, applied for New York 2016. At the time, it was only five frames. Uh, but I wasn't accepted. And uh, no, I haven't exhibited in the US yet. And certainly something I want to do. Well, maybe that's something we can, we can work on with you. And um, I mean, the ATA, um, they have, well, they just had a, an event in uh, Sacramento associated with the uh, APS um, summer show. And um, Maybe that's something I can try and find out when the ATA is next meeting and where they're next meeting. And perhaps we can encourage you to come over with the exhibit. Okay. Cleveland. I'll be, I'll be happy to do that. Cleveland next August. Okay. Cleveland, not the great city. You can go to the, uh, what is it? Football Hall of Fame or something. <laughs> rock and roll, rock and roll museum. Okay. <laughs> All right. TSS. No, that's the ATA. Okay, the ATA, okay. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, hi, uh, I have a question uh, regarding, yes. it might be uh, a you know, stupid question, but uh, I just uh, want to understand like what is the difference or I would say distinction between topical philately and thematic philately. Is thematic philately a subset of topical philately or is it a subset with some constraints? What is it? How do you view I would it? say I would say uh, thematic and, and topical are, are next door neighbors. A topical collector is uh, usually concerned with well, most of them are collecting stamps only and they're goal is to get all the stamps cancellations but to get as many as possible in their topic so if uh, let's say you collect baseball you want all the stamps that are connected to baseball and show the game the stadiums and so on a thematic collector is not running for completion but is aiming to tell a story so <clears throat> let's say I tell a story of, of chess and I want to show a page devoted to Bobby Fischer. I do not need all 30 stamps that were issued, let's say 30, I don't know, around the world that depict Bobby Fischer. I don't care if I have all of them. I, I care that I have a good Bobby Fischer item to tell the story. So the... the challenge is really about the story and not about the completion. Uh, I talk about world champions. I, okay, I think I've answered that. So. Um, um, Van, Martin, was Van, that clear enough? Yeah. Well, Van actually has another comment, Yoram. Okay. I couldn't hear anything. So, Colin, could you? Um, yeah, let me try and let me try and repeat. 
basically what Ben said is that here in the US, a topical exhibit, if you take the example of owls, would be the hundred stamps from around the world that show owls. They would all have a direct visual connection with an owl on the stem. Whereas within the US, a, a thematic would look at the habitat of the owl, the food sources of the owl, the predators on the owl. Essentially, you take the owl and you expand out aspects of the life cycle of the owl that bring in uh, a, a nest, it brings in a barn, it brings in food sources, you know, different bugs and insects or, yes. or small predators. And so you have a much broader perspective rather than just a direct image-based exhibit. Um, that's kind of the American approach to yes, thematic yeah. and topical. Yeah, I, I accept that. I think that's a very good uh, description. Okay, how are we doing for other questions? Um, Jean has a question. She raised Jean, yeah. okay. can you I, unmute uh, Hi. Yeah, hi, Yoram. Uh, wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, I, so, you know, you talked about innovation and bringing in unexpected items that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see in a chess uh, exhibit, but if you can make a connection with the, you know, a thematic connection with the postal aspects of the item, then that's a way to show innovation. So I, I fully embrace that. I've tried to do that in my blood exhibit as well. It's also a modern topic. The first stamp was 1942. So there's no older material that's directly related. But I wonder if you have ever had comments from judges that an item that you had in the exhibit was it was too much of a stretch or you know it wasn't um, that you were that you were stretching too much to include a significant item. Um, I never got such a comment from a judge. I got it occasionally, not often, but I got it occasionally from fellow exhibitors. <laughs> and on some specific cases. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, like anything else, I think it's also a matter of taste. And um, everybody, you know, have different views and that's okay. Um, I think what you need, if, if, if you're using all these innovative tricks, is you want to make sure you don't overuse them. And it should be, I, I think of it like, um, you know, adding salt to, to a stew. You don't want to overdo it because then it'll be just too salty. Um, where's, the, where's the limit? There's no definite answer, <laughs> luckily, because that makes it more interesting. Yeah, I think that's the best. I think that's the best part of thematic exhibiting is, yeah. is you can use your creativity and imagination and, and yes. bring in all kinds of, there's no limit really. And you can poach things from all branches of philately. Right. Okay, well, um... Yoram, thank you very much for, for you. your presentation. I hope you're going to stay on. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk. You're welcome. Um, would you like to?